Okay, Nate, we are live. Great. Hey, everyone. Um, my name is Nate McGacky. I am the executive director of Arts North Carolina, the state's advocacy organization for the arts. Um, and I really want to welcome you and thank you for joining us uh, for today's webinar, Recommendations for Arts Education as North Carolina Reopens Schools. Uh, so, you know, I think that the, uh, the webinar itself is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, this, or the title is self-explanatory. Um, this guide that we're going to be reviewing and talking about today was a, a real partnership between six organizations, uh, Arts North Carolina, the North Carolina Arts Educa Education Association, North Carolina Dance Education Organization, North Carolina Music Educators Association, uh, North Carolina Theater Arts Educators, as well as the North Carolina Theater Conference. Uh, I'm really excited today that I'm going to be joined by uh, Laura Soderman, the Vice President of the North Carolina Dance Education Organization, Carol Earnhardt, uh, President of the North Carolina Music Educators Association, Chuck Stowe, who is the President of the North Carolina Theater Arts Educators, and Rebecca Dow, who is the past President of the North Carolina Art Education Association. Uh, we are also going to have Brandon Rader and Sayre Grinley on the line today, both from the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction, um, so that if any, uh, any of the questions that come up uh, veer into their field, that they'll be available to uh, help answer those as well. So, um, so a little bit about the guide. Um, this was a project that came about because uh, we were seeing a trend in conversations that were happening um, in states and communities nationally about uh, cutting arts instruction in schools uh, because it was dangerous, because it was difficult, um, and that it was going to be hard to implement social distancing. And, um, and that we felt that the best way to answer that was to, uh, was to show that that's not true, right? To find a way um, that, uh, that there is a way forward and that particularly in this time, arts education is more necessary than ever. Um, you'll see the top of this slide a statement, and you'll see this statement repeated uh, or a variation of it on just about every page of the guide, and that is it is imperative to sustain the availability of arts education during this unprecedented time. These recommendations can guide arts education to continue safely in our schools, and that is really the whole purpose of this document is to, um, is to emphasize the need for arts education right now, uh, as well as, as to show how it can be done safely. Uh, you can see the link there. Um, there's a lot of information on these slides. I encourage folks to go to um, artsnc.org to the COVID-19 training and videos and resources page where you can get access these slides um, and then utilize all those links in the information for your reference. Um, something important to point out when we're talking about this guide, these are recommendations. This is just some guidance. This is um, best practices and common sense. These are not mandates, right? We are all of these organizations are advocacy-based and educator representatives. Um, these are teacher recommendations for other teachers and some ways of, uh, based on research to go about this. We are not a government agency putting out mandates. Um, so I think that that's very, very important to understand. So everybody's gonna have to implement this in their own way. We strongly encourage um, everyone to follow the laws, guidance, restrictions from any government agency or health officials or school administration, your principal, your superintendent, whatever that guidance is that is happening um, for your school at your level, um, that's going to take precedence over, uh, over these suggestions. This is really just a guide to help, uh, help those officials to craft that in terms of arts education. Um, we really uh, see this as a reference um, for the local education agencies uh, and schools as they start to create their plans to reopen under the State Board of Education and Department of uh, Public Instruction Guide for Reopening Schools, the Lighting the Way document that came out last week. Um, I know there's, gonna be a, there's a lot of questions about Plan A, Plan B, Plan C, with Plan C being remote learning. This is more of a Plan B, Plan A sort of document, right? How are we going to be able to educate children in the schools? Um, obviously, this is a reference for teachers in the classroom. You know, print the pages that you're going to need, keep them handy uh, in your desk drawer. Uh, it's kind of a way to check. So um, we're hoping that this document can um, be useful for uh, throughout the duration uh, of our transition back into schools. 
Um, I think another thing that is really important to point out that this document was created to be a advocacy tool, both at the school level and at the district level. And really we submitted this to the superintendent and the state board of education so that we would be using this document to advocate at the state level as well. Um, there's a lot of links to a document called Arts Education is Essential. Uh, and that is um, something that is, uh, was a nationally produced document um, lots of partners, lots of very um, important organizations put input into this document. Uh, and certainly we all sign off on, it talks about how the arts education is important to the social emotional well-being of students, um, social emotional education as well. That's one of the reasons why we're not gonna go over that section, but there is a social emotional learning section um, of the document as well. Talks about how um, arts education creates a welcoming environment, um, which is a positive way for, for students to self uh, to express themselves, um, which is really so crucial to their education. And also talks about how uh, arts education is part of a well-rounded education, uh, which is actually part of uh, federal law and the Every Student Succeeds Act. So um, making this available, making sure that your principal has this document in their hand, making sure that your, um, that your school board, making sure that your superintendent, making sure that those people, those decision makers have this document is a way to connect them to those points so that they're understanding that it's not just, that the arts aren't just safe, but they're also important and essential at this very um, challenging time. Um, so, that, that's a little bit about the advocacy tool. I also want to note that this document is designed so that you would use your discipline specific uh, pages, but also the general pages, right? So it might not say in the discipline specific uh, page that you should be keeping six foot of social distance. That's covered in the general. So we're going to go through the general recommendations first. Um, and, and then we're going to have each of these educators uh, talk a little bit about their discipline specific stuff. Um, the last thing is, uh, is this is a living document. Um, we know that uh, guidelines are going to change. Um, there's going to be suggestions about what we're saying and how we're saying it as we gain more information. Um, and all the organizations want to make sure that they're getting input from the teachers. We created this document with the best resources that we had available. Uh, but as, um, as we move forward, we can broaden that umbrella and each organization um, has a link uh, on their slide that you can find um, when, you, if, when you download the slides that'll bring you to a form where you can make those suggestions for each of those, um, of, of those specific uh, disciplines. So I encourage everybody to do that if you have any thoughts. So general recommendations, um, you know, first, broad overview here, obviously social distancing, um, six feet apart. This is something that we're hearing a lot about. And really when it comes to social distancing in the classroom, you know, you're going to be uh, at a minimum in, uh, implementing the same social distancing that you'd be implementing in any other class. Uh, if the desks are six feet apart, then your students need to be six feet apart. Um, certainly sanitation, hand sanitizer, making sure the kids are washing their hands, keeping areas clean and wiped down. These are all generally good recommendations for any class um, and as, uh, including arts education classes as well. Uh, a few notes on logistics. Um, you know, there's some suggestions in here on how do we make class changes work a little bit more seamlessly, allowing time. Maybe if you've got two doors, one's for an entrance, one for an exit or um, you know, limiting restroom usage, uh, maybe making sure that class sizes are smaller. So just kind of thinking through the logistics that are going to allow you to implement all of these, um, all of these recommendations a little bit more effectively. Also minimize um, touching of shared surfaces, uh, such things as um, getting rid of lost and founds or um, uh, you know, propping doors open so that people don't have to keep touching the door handle over and over again. Um, so that's just a, a way that, um, that we're, you know, kind of just applying logic to the logistics of your classroom. Uh, and then ventilation, I think, is really key, particularly as we learn more about the virus and we, um, we understand uh, that it is very airborne and this is important. Um, any opportunities to have class outdoors, um, to instruct outdoors, is going to be crucial because, uh, you know, we know that spread uh, risks are greatly reduced when they're outdoors. Um, you know, opening windows is a great thing. Um, air filters that, um, 
with, uh, with the HEPA air purifiers installed certainly is a higher cost way to approach that. But, um, you know, just kind of think about your air. Also, more humid environments might be better um, to lower transition, uh, transmission rates. Um, and also uh, fans, like that may seem like a really good idea that, uh, you know, a bunch of box fans in your room can be actually pushing that virus into everyone's faces. So limiting the use of box fans if you're drying the paint on scenery um, is something to consider. So uh, without any further ado, I am going to hand this off to uh, Laura Soderman, who is the Vice President of the North Carolina Dance Education uh, organization and let her talk a little bit about uh, about those guidelines as well. Good morning and thank you Nate for uh, allowing me to be here with you all and present on this. Um, again, these are just general recommendations. Um, they were taken primarily from the Dance USA uh, organization and they had a task force that has done extensive research in putting together guidelines um, so that we can return safely to our studios and um, to, to begin our work again with our dancers. I think the first thing that is on everyone's mind, of course, is how do we prep our space? And so the document does lay out several suggestions for ways in which we can um, tape off our floor space. They do suggest that perhaps a 10 foot social distancing rule for um, physical activity might be uh, followed because with deeper respiratory breathing, uh, there is a possibility of uh, an increased heart rate. There is a, a possibility of a greater spread. Um, and so you may want to just take those measurements within the room. Uh, there could be a way in which you tape off the floor so that you are assigning boxes or spots to particular students. Um, and another thing could be that you want to take into account your uh, parameters of the room so that if students are performing in smaller groups and students are observing, that there's a space for them to stand uh, in order to observe. Uh, you could also make sure that the space around the teacher's desk and where your music station is has a little bit of a greater distance between you and the students to provide that teacher a safe spot um, to move and, and be in uh, throughout the day that uh, would not risk contamination. And, um, and then of course, where are the students putting their belongings? So one of the suggestions is also that perhaps we forego the, the, the dress code um, and that we're trying to encourage these students to underdress or to wear movement appropriate clothing to school or to their, to their studios um, so that they have, can limit the time within the dressing rooms themselves and already have that their uh, physical attire that they need for, for safe practice. And then how do we uh, allow for their bags to be in designated areas that we can easily wipe down and that they can have distance between their belongings and another student. So alternating lockers if you have them or again just spaces on a floor area that you uh, can make sure that belongs specifically to one particular child. Um, and then being able, of course, to have some time to wipe things down, whether you're you know, soliciting some student volunteers or that you're taking that, that precaution at the end of class to prep the space for the next group that comes in. Um, and using ballet bars, you know, to again measure off the areas of the bar, to have them all facing on one side. So I know that a lot of times in your ballet bar, you have students uh, on alternate sides of the bar facing the different directions. This goes into even the practice of the dance training on the, the center floor is that it is encouraged that all dancers face the same direction. So it will be changing the spatial relationships that we so frequently use in our work, um, but it definitely will help to reduce the risk of, of spread if all faces are um, facing the same direction in your instruction. Uh, street shoes, things like that, that we already uh, say, please do not bring onto the dance floor, that should definitely continue to be enforced. And things like water bottles um, to limit, we want to encourage students to make sure that they're bringing their own uh, bottles for, for hydration throughout the class and trying to limit that time that they may be going to public water fountains. Um, so this is just kind of, uh, again, ways that you can prep your space. Uh, other things such as yoga mats or blocks, any other types of classroom supplies that you might share amongst students uh, is strongly encouraged that we no longer share, but that students have their own that they are bringing uh, to the classroom environment. And again, if, if 
we have to share that there is a method for you to sanitize uh, those things and wipe them down um, from one class to the next. And um, so then within the teaching, uh, well, and sanitizing the dance floor, just going back to the second bullet of the document, um, it is suggested that we make sure that we are using the appropriate cleaning solutions, whether we have our Marley floor, whether we have a, a polyurethane wood floor, and that they should be uh, at least once a day um, completely cleaned and uh, used with a mop with the proper solution so that we can uh, sanitize the, the floor surface. Talking about instruction, uh, again, these are only guidelines. These are only things that we could suggest to help you uh, sort of rethink of what you may be doing in your design of your curriculum and in the ways in which you teach. Um, we've already said face the same direction and how to distance apart. But perhaps uh, if you cannot lessen the numbers in your classroom, perhaps you have stations in which some students are working on uh, reading or writing or responding. And so they have more of a sedentary type of work for that class. And then you're able to only move with a more limited number of students on your dance floor. And so the other students could be spread out along the parameters of the room, working on other assignments. And then you could rotate that as the, uh, the week goes on. Um, if you are going across the floor, they're actually, again, encouraging that we refrain from doing that until uh, a little bit deeper into the other phases. And but to make sure that students are traveling side by side and go directly across the floor before the next group comes uh, in, their, in their footsteps behind them. And um, just really finding that way to, again, encourage that you're maintaining that distance uh, through the, the movement instruction that you're doing. And so again, these are, there are other ways, uh, resources that you can go to. The North Carolina Dance Education Organization, we have our own website in which we are continually working to update uh, and add things as they may help us as dance educators uh, understand things that we can do to uh, better prepare ourselves and our students for uh, what's coming uh, in next, for next year. And um, there's the national organization as well as the Dance USA Task Force. Uh, it's a great opportunity to read deeper of the research. We do have a Google document, a Google form, in which we are asking for your feedback and your questions um, so that we can continually help you, especially as we start rolling into our school years and questions start to arise of how do I do this? Or I'm really struggling understanding what, what my possibilities are, how I might change this. And so we hope to, again, work all collectively um, to find our best answers and get arts you know, strong as, as we know that they are and uh, able to happen in our schools because it is important. And so thank you, Nate, for that. And uh, I'm ready to pass on the mic. Um, actually, we have a quick question here. Um, okay. Someone posted a question about for stretching and dance, would you recommend students bring their own mats? And I think that that kind of uh, addresses a larger question, which is, how much um, equipment do you think would be prudent to ask students to bring uh, during this time? Yeah, it, it really will limit it. So yes, I did touch on that bullet and it is in the document that if using a yoga mats or any sort of um, blocks or therabands or any type of uh, equipment that you might be sharing from one classroom to the next, it is uh, advised that we do not share and that students do bring their own if possible. And then if, again, if not, that you have a method in which you can sanitize those. I think the challenge is gonna be obviously for like the K-12 uh, situation where these kids are in other classes throughout the day, what is the realistic expectation that they're gonna be able to go from you know, all their other classes carrying uh, so much, uh, so many things like a yoga mat. But um, I think that if it is possible for them to come with those materials that they definitely bring them themselves. Perhaps you don't use the mats, but you um, use a towel instead, something that can be rolled up a little bit tighter and put into their bags. So I think it's gonna be looking a little bit outside of what we're used to doing and finding um, more flexible options for our students and for our practice. Does that answer the question, I hope? I hope so, yes, we can move on now. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, 
for that. That's fantastic. Uh, our next section, uh, we're going to introduce Carol Earnhardt. She is the president of the North Carolina Music Educators Association, and she'll be discussing a uh, recommendation for music education. So thank you very much, Carol. You're welcome. Good morning, everybody. Um, I do want to say from the beginning that our recommendations were taken from the, mu uh, the Music Educators Association of Missouri. Um, and I did talk to the president there. Um, uh, they had about 48 hours uh, to put something together and teachers from around their state, uh, teacher leaders from around their state, contributed guidelines and put it in a document. When we received that document, there was a lot of repetitiveness between the sections uh, of general music, elementary, and ensemble guidelines. And what I did was I just went in and combined some of those things. So what you see uh, in the document are guidelines for all levels and all types of classes, ensembles and general music. And so the first section is considering practicing social distancing um, uh, before, after, and during class. And it just speaks about, you know, the how are we going to move the kids apart in this situation um, so that they are far enough away so that they can make music. Um, and then after that, there's a section instructional implications, which um, speaks to these recommendations and how it would look in the classroom. Um, of course, these are not exhaustive, but suggestions for handling your day-to-day -day activities in your classroom. And then the final um, guidelines, uh, not final, but the third section is general sanitation guidelines. So in a music classroom, typically um, you may have instruments in that classroom or equipment that you use in a general music classroom or even in a high school or middle school chorus class that you need to consider um, if students are, we would rather students not share those instruments, but if you have to use them in the following class that they are sanitized between classes. Also a suggestion that music uh, if you follow copyright laws, music can be projected on a screen rather than students sharing music um, in the same class or over uh, multiple classes. And finally, we have some instrumental music guidelines. There are already a set of instrument cleaning guidelines uh, from NAM and NAFME and NFHS that you can follow, but we offered some other things uh, considering marching band and um, uh, disinfectant sprays for mouthpieces and things like that. Um, I would like to say that I met with my section chairs yesterday. So um, in the music world, uh, we are, we sort of are siphoned off into different levels and different types of classrooms. There's orchestra, band, chorus, um, general music, then you have the different levels at the elementary level, at the middle school level, and high school level. Um, and so uh, each of those sections, of course, deal with different um, events in their classroom and, and need to consider, have, need to have different considerations. So I have um, commissioned those section chairs, if you want to say, to go back to their boards, and they are looking at specific guidelines for their activities in the marching, with the marching band, with the um, orchestra, uh, with the elementary general music, and how would these guidelines look in plan A, plan B, and plan C. And like Nate said, this is a living document. And so as we learn more throughout the summer, and things are moving at an incredible rate with uh, scientists, um, we're finding new discoveries every single day. We want to apply that knowledge to how our classrooms will look in the fall. So thank goodness we have the summer uh, to catch up on all that science, and to make more recommendations uh, are what we're going to do in August. One such recommendation is the aerosol study that is a multi-million dollar study and is being supported by many national organizations and looking at aerosol rates for um, uh, third through eighth graders. Uh, so when they sing or when they are doing activities in the music classroom, how far does their aerosol or what is coming out of their mouth spread throughout the room? Is it in fact six feet when they sing? Is it less? Is it more? And they're also looking at different kind of, um, kinds of families of instruments and also comparing um, in high school a soprano compared to an alto and a tenor and a bass. So that will certainly inform 
uh, what we are doing with this document and further recommendations for the fall. Um, we also have a Google form for you to respond. We've already had uh, close to 70 respondents from our members um, and we would love to hear what you have to say. That would definitely help out the uh, section chairs as they make guidelines for each of their sections and would help us out as we make um, adjustments to this document um, throughout the summer. So, and that's it, Nick. Great. Great, thank you so much, Carol. Uh, that was fantastic. Uh, so um, next we have uh, Chuck Stowe, who is the president of the North Carolina Theater Arts Educators, and he's going to be reviewing some of the recommendations for theater arts classrooms. Hi, everyone. I'm Chuck Stowe, president of North Carolina Theater Arts Educators, or NCTAE. As I begin, I want to thank Angie Hayes, the executive director of North Carolina Theater Conference, Angie and I worked together to craft the theater arts section of this document with input from Nate and others on the team. Our focus with creating this document with this web webinar is that it's imperative to sustain the availability of theater arts education and all the arts during this unprecedented time. Our goal is to equip you to advocate for making arts education work in every space. You can find a way to make theater arts work in your schools. You need to be prepared to be proactive with your administration and possibly with your district leadership. You are the best advocate for your program. One quick example, Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools theater arts teachers have already met and crafted documents for their district. In addition to using state level guidance on facilities and equipment, they went even further and addressed how that they can effectively address each of the state content standards in a variety of learning environments. They're being proactive and they're making it work. As we uh, move into the document, let's look at scheduling classes, rehearsals, performances. Scheduling these activities outdoors as much as possible with weather conditions being considered. Start looking now for places you might use and look for your alternatives when the weather isn't cooperating. Whether it's heat, rain, wind, uh, where, where will you go, what will you do? Create separation in large spaces to rehearse smaller groups simultaneously while still observing social distancing. It adds more work initially, but if you can equip your students to lead while you keep floating among the groups, you can stay visible and accessible to everyone. Minimize, <clears throat> excuse me, minimize numbers of students in rehearsal rooms and theater by only rehearsing scenes or sections of your show when possible. Material selection and pre-planning are big assets here. Look for scripts that can be easily worked in smaller groups. Students should be provided with their own theater props, makeup, costumes, and any other equipment for class rehearsal or performance. We tell them all the time, don't touch someone else's prop. This viral scare may actually help them remember that theater rule. And disinfect everything, every day, every time it's used. Teachers should have access to technology to broadcast instruction due to increased social distancing. Most of us are good at projection, but having these tools can help save vocal strain. All efforts should be made at every level to assist students in creating personal activities that include logging and reporting of learning processes, achievement of standards, and all available assessment benchmarks. With increased focus on individualized learning and project-based learning, there has to be a clear record that students are making acceptable and measurable progress. When rehearsing or performing musical numbers, follow guidelines for music education. With choreography, follow the guidelines for dance education. And I'd like to add, with costume sets and props building, we should follow the guidelines for visual arts education. As we look at storage spaces and dressing rooms, make certain you devise an access plan that minimizes the number of students or staff who utilize the spaces and preserve social distancing. Also, make sure the space is sanitized after each use. Students should not be required to use costumes until final rehearsals or performances. Most of us do this anyway. Dressing rooms should not be open to students until dress rehearsals and performance. Utilize hallway bathrooms and nearby classrooms if necessary to comply with social distancing. This is vital. We must keep them appropriately distanced while preparing for rehearsals and performances. Students should not be required to change into rehearsal clothing. Students should wear clothing that is appropriate for weather conditions, allows for full movement, 
and is safe for participation when scheduled for theater arts classes or activity. Often our actors may wear rehearsal skirts or coats to become used to moving in these garments. Rather than changing, they should add these garments over their street clothes, and these should be kept separately for each garment and sanitized after each use. As we consider performance activities for students, we should consider plays with smaller cast or double casting. Double casting involves twice the number of students, two cast for each show, but you're only working with a max of half the total group at a time. Use of larger equipment, set pieces, platforms, etc., for stage performance and rehearsal that cannot be easily disinfected should be kept at a minimum. Curtains and drops should be flown out, drawn open, or somehow pulled out of the way during rehearsals. Mark the floor so the performers know where the platforms and curtains will be. Look at the dance education guidelines for info on sanitizing the floor for rehearsals. Consider the use of recorded music instead of live musicians to accompany rehearsal and performance. If using live music's music, follow guidelines for instrumental music. Cast understudies and swing performers to allow for missed rehearsal and performances for students who may feel sick or may need to use in excused absences. The swings and understudies can learn their parts watching from the auditorium, possibly even watching remotely. Schedule time for them to work their sections on stage. That was a lot to say, and I tried talking fast. There'll be a time to take your questions later in the webinar. Nate? Thank you so much, Chuck. I really appreciate that. Uh, next up, we have uh, Rebecca Dow. Uh, she is the past, immediate past president of the North Carolina Art Education Association. Uh, is gonna go over visual, visual arts education guidelines. So take it away, Rebecca. Thank you, Nate. Good morning, everyone. Um, first, I wanted to tell you a little bit about how we uh, went about creating this document. We, uh, like everyone else, based ours off the Missouri document. Um, the president-elect, the president myself, got together first, discussed the document a little bit. We then put it in our Google Drive, made some comments and suggestions, and then opened up to our entire board. Uh, so if you're not aware, our board has representation from across the state in a variety of different levels from kindergarten through secondary to retired division. So they all had a chance to put some input into this document as well. And then we came back as a president team and made the final edits. Um, and just as everybody else, we have a form that you'll see the link there where you can also contribute to the document should you come across something, uh, new information or a situation that we haven't covered within the, um, the guidelines. So one of the things that we talked about was we wanted to make sure that our guidelines were not too specific because it needs to be able to um, envision in, in a variety of places. It's kind of like selling a house. You, you don't, if you put certain furniture in there a certain way, then it's difficult for people to imagine it with their own personal things. So um, that's the idea is, is to kind of keep it um, usable um, and give you an idea without being too specific. One of the hot topics that we went through, um, meaning it was a conversation that everybody agreed on, there wasn't really any um, disagreement on that, was um, the uh, traveling art teachers. We really wanted to make sure that wording was in such a way that it looked still possible. We didn't want to make it difficult. Uh, we don't want there to be any thought, oh, this is too difficult, we should just cut that. Um, so it is very possible and we just wanted to, to outline that. Um, and then of course, anytime you're using materials, if we're switching classrooms or if the students are coming to us, there's the question of cleaning the materials and the time that it takes. All of that is possible if um, administration and the art teacher are organized. Uh, so we tried to explain, you know, to, to clear that out in how we stated each of the guidelines. I wanted to also suggest that there's a way to um, combine some of these as well. For example, um, just looking at my notes here. The, uh, the, the chair, the spacing and your classroom management. Everybody might have different types of tables. Uh, having six feet apart is a little bit more difficult, I think, in an art room because we have larger tables, uh, at least some of us. 
Um, so consider instead of having, for example, I have, I teach elementary, so I have two children on either side of a table. I may have to have one on each side. Um, you also can consider the personal dividers, the, the sneeze guards, and those can be made from a variety of materials. We talked about trying to put that in there and again said, that's too specific. We need to leave that open for the individual schools for what they have available to them. Um, but again, we, we can see that it is doable. Uh, the other topic that was uh, a big discussion was um, things such as clay. A lot of people didn't know clay was disinfectant uh, or allowed or could, could be cleaned. Uh, I know in college I was trained we could do it with vinegar, but it can also be done with bleach. So we included that in there as well. Um, there really isn't much that we do that is not possible with a little bit of flexibility. Uh, also the personal materials for each student, that was another uh, discussion that we had. Um, and that would apply to whether the students come to your classroom or whether you're going from classroom to classroom. Uh, being organized, keeping things labeled and put in a, a place where they're not touched by um, uh, the other classes is possible. Of course, it's not ideal, but we're going to be flexible. So we're part of a solution and not um, hindering our own programs. Uh, and in that alignment, I would also say one of the other ideas that we talked about and put in there was that we could limit within our projects the materials we use. So instead of doing multimedia where you're doing collage and you're doing painting, um, you might just do painting or you might just do drawing. Keep it a little bit more simple um, and keep in mind that this is not long term. This is temporary. This is only for a designated time even though we don't have specific dates. Um, so I think that just about covers most of it. I don't want to go through the specifics because I know that you all can take time to read all that. But again, if you have suggestions or um, additional information that comes, comes about, please use the form. I'll share it also on our Facebook page um, for, so it's available for you. Great, thank you so much, Rebecca. That, that was really helpful. Uh, to touch on two points that uh, I, I think we've uh, talked a little bit about in the last few um, sessions. Um, one is uh, the fact that this is, that these are suggestions and they're uh, general so that they can be applied to a lot of situations. Um, this is also an advocacy concern as well. Uh, so, you know, we don't necessarily want to create an exhaustive 380 page document for arts instruction that a school board member might take one look at and say, uh, no, let's just not do arts education because this is far too complicated. We want it to remain flexible, but certainly as we um, move forward, the document will get more specific, um, like Carol mentioned, um, for different sections and, and things like that. So that's, that's a line that we're trying to balance as an advocacy piece as well as an instructional piece. Um, and I know that uh, all these organizations are gonna do a great job of, of updating that um, information and making that available either through the document or on their website as well. Um, another thing to touch back on, um, we've mentioned a couple of times the Missouri document that we also mentioned in the introduction uh, of this document. Uh, they, uh, the, the inspiration for, for that document that, as Carol said, was put together very quickly uh, was that the original guidelines that the Association of, um, State, of, uh, of uh, School Boards put together actually recommended that all arts instruction in Missouri um, be stopped until um, for further notice and the, the arts teachers got together. So the, the very beginning of this document was um, as an advocacy piece to show how safely uh, the arts could be done um, to stop what was, what was almost a complete elimination of arts education in the state of Missouri. So um, we've, we've seen this uh, as effective and, and Missouri gave us a great place to start. We've heard back from Missouri that they've, uh, they've been very impressed with what North Carolina has built on um, from their original document. So uh, and we want to thank them for their, their uh, addition to what we've done. Um, a few things that are going to be on these slides that you can download. Um, certainly the uh, Department of Health and uh, Human Services uh, document for strong public schools. That's sort of the, the first document that came out. 
Uh, then uh, also last week, State Board of Education, Department of Public Instruction put out Lighting Our Way Forward guide. Um, you can link to that. That has, tells a little bit more about that Plan A, Plan B, and Plan C that all the local school districts are going to be um, coming up with in the next few months that we're hoping to help inform. Uh, the Guide to Reopening the Arts in North Carolina. This was um, something, a guide that Arts North Carolina um, put together in partnership with the North Carolina Arts Council, North Carolina Presenting Consortium, and the North Carolina Theater Conference um, about opening up um, museums and theaters. So a lot of useful information in there, particularly as you start opening up your schools and venues to the public uh, in addition to students. So that's, um, and it's also referenced in our document as well here. Um, certainly, I encourage everyone, um, particularly as you're looking at the Plan C options, um, to check out the Arts at NC, um, North Carolina Department of Public Instruction, Arts Education Remote Learning Resources, um, which I'm sure that a lot of you have already uh, checked out. Certainly, the Arts Education is Essential document um, that I referenced earlier in the presentation. Uh, and please check out the um, Arts North Carolina Open Arts Resources. Uh, we've got uh, government guidance, education guidance, camp guidance, professional guidance, um, some legal guidance in there. Uh, we're trying to really make that a one-stop shop for all the arts to move forward into reopening um, our facilities and, um, and revitalizing um, and rejoining our communities. So, um, and then also you'll see there's uh, all of the websites for all of the organizations that contributed this document and that you've heard from today. So, um, without any further ado, I think we can uh, see if there are any questions uh, on what we reviewed today. We actually have quite a few questions. Um, one of them has to do with, uh, it's kind of a two-part question. I'm taking one question from Facebook and one question from, um, from our Zoom group about the needs of schools, to, uh, increased mm -hmm. needs of schools to provide the uh, sanitizing equipment for all of this and also the time to do it. Um, somebody expressed a question about the, the schedules being adjusted for cleaning and I don't know if any of uh, you have done that. That may um, have to go to our friends from BPI who might be able to answer that question. Well, I, I will just kind of, before I hand it over to um, Brandon and Sayward, just a quick note that um, we certainly are advocating um, that yes, there's certainly going to be additional cost with cleaning products. So I think it's important when you're having these conversations um, that we're mentioning that, you know, everybody's gonna need cleaning products. So those cleaning products and sanitation products in the classroom um, are something that are gonna need to be provided and considered in planning this um, as they're considered in all school planning um, as we get ready to reopen. Um, and, uh, and I think that that's um, really important as well as planning the day to make sure that there is time uh, left in between classes. So that general advocacy for how the entire school day operates and, and those expenses and considerations are made, um, I think is key in, in what we're talking about. Uh, Brandon and Saber, did you have anything to add to that? Um, the only thing that I would have to add to that is that um, I think it's important for us to perhaps change our mindsets and take a look at our standards. Um, perhaps this is not the right time to use African drums. Perhaps this is not the right time to use ORF instruments. Perhaps, you know, this is not the right time to teach the way that we have always taught um, and to be creative and look at new ways that we can still teach the same standards in a deep and rigorous way that is just different than we've done in the past. Great. And I'll just add, you know, there modifications may need to be made for your specific needs, the way that you are deciding to run your class and up to your school and your individual situations. So there's not gonna be a one size fits all on all of these. Um, but if you're feeling like you need more time to clean and sanitize, you know, there, there was this suggestion to either use the last few minutes of class, have a couple of student volunteers to assist with some of that. You know, it may need to be flexible um, and you might need to think a little bit more clearly on how you integrate those, um, uh, is structures and, and, and that model within your class structure as well. So you're teaching the students to also care for the space in the same way and using that as a procedure in your instruction. 
Kate, can I weigh yeah. in? I was also thinking that, you know, again, it's a, a great opportunity as you look at how you structure your class uh, and the time in which you're spending on certain activities, that it could be a time for student reflection so that they are, again, seated in an area uh, where you're then allowed, while they're privately writing, uh, you know, you're allowed to then use your time within that schedule to do what you need to do um, to sanitize the space. So I think it's also just examining our instruction and how we can continue to keep kids engaged, you know, to the bell as best as we can. Teaching bell to bell has always been, um, you know, widely encouraged in the schools so that we're not letting them just stand around. But again, finding ways that we can keep them engaged in learning while we take the time that we need to make sure that the space is sanitized. I would imagine, and I could be wrong, <clears throat> But this is going to be something that schools have to consider for every teacher and not just arts teachers. They're going to have to, they're going to be required to um, a lot in some way, some extra time for cleaning throughout the day. So, um, but I would start thinking of your classroom, like Laura said, in a way that uh, you could allow a little, a little more time during the class period to get things sanitized for the next class uh, set of students. I'd also like to add to that for those in visual arts, especially where we're always wanting to create. I know I've been to a lot of workshops and seen a lot of amazing things that I'm like, oh, that's awesome. And then as I think about it, well, when do I have the time to do that? Because we're creating, which of course is what we want. But this may be one of those opportunities where you don't create every day and you're pulling out some of those resources, the virtual tours at museums and things like that, that are so amazing and, and great experiences in and of themselves and uh, kind of balance and broaden our visual art field. So don't feel like you have to create every day and therefore you wouldn't have to deal with that cleaning aspect mm -hmm. every day. Going along with what Rebecca was just saying, um, being able to, as we reflect on possibilities of days in and out of school with remote learning, also finding ways if we've got half of our students one day and half of them another day, um, on those days when they're doing the remote learning is a great opportunity to use those virtual tours and some of those exploration tools that are out there, uh, not only in visual art, but also in theater. And I'm, I think there's some similar tools in the other disciplines as well, but uh, that's part of what we've been exploring are ways to handle the duality of when you've got students in both environments. Well, that segues, yeah, that, does somebody else have something to add? No, go ahead, Christine. Okay, that segues into another great question. Um, while you were speaking, Chuck, you um, were talking about technology platforms and somebody was um, asked the question about what kind of technology platforms can be used. I'm assuming he means for, you know, teaching purposes or for performing purposes. I can speak to the fact that every LEA um, is going to be up against a different set of technology. Some are you know, Mac based, some of them are Chromebook based. Um, everybody has their own funding limitations. And since we are a local control state, those decisions are completely up to the local school board to make. Um, so while there are some um, platforms that integrate better with certain uh, tools, like for example, in the North Carolina Museum of Art, all have Google Classroom, um, buttons that allow you to directly import their stuff. Um, that That is a decision that can only be made by the local school board. Great, great that's great. Um, I've had a couple questions about who has seen this, um, who have has this guide been shared with? Has this guide been shared with superintendents or local school districts? Or is that something that you recommend that each person do with their individual school? So I will say that um, Arts North Carolina, uh, once this document was finalized, um, I think it was about two weeks ago, maybe not quite two weeks ago, uh, but prior to, um, to any of the, the state's um, recommendations becoming public, uh, this document was submitted to the superintendent uh, as well as other leaders within the Department of Public Instruction. 
um, at the state level, the state superintendent, um, Superintendent Johnson. Um, it was also uh, shared with um, the Governor Cooper's uh, staff, uh, I, uh, because Arts North Carolina has a, um, a, a connection um, to the council's office um, with Governor Cooper as we work through um, phase one and phase two of reopening and questions there. So we made sure that they were uh, aware that this document was being submitted. Um, and then I was also able to share it with a large number of um, uh, local arts coordinators um, as well from a mailing list I obtained. I will say that um, that being said, don't necessarily assume that, um, that the people that are making the decisions in your county have this document available to them. Send them the link, um, send them to the website, let them know that it is there. If they've already got it, great, then you're just advocating for how important it is. If they don't have it, then you just gave them a resource that can, that's gonna be crucial for them to have. So, um, and as, as Brandon was saying, like we are a local control state, these plans and these decisions are being made locally. So um, making sure that, uh, that you're emailing your principal, that you're emailing your, um, your school board, you're emailing your su local superintendents, that all of those folks have access to the documents and that all of those people uh, understand how important arts education is locally uh, that's going to be the key to making this transition work. And I have, I'm sorry, also this document is going to change throughout the summer. And um, like I said before, we've asked our section chairs to come back with recommendations for their particular classrooms. And that deadline for them is July 7th. And I think after that point, before July 20th, we would like to share with principals and again with arts coordinators. And it's like Nate said, this is a, an, it started as an advocacy document. It does have guidelines, but those guidelines are gonna be um, even narrowed down throughout the summer to help us begin the school year. Yeah, and I just wanted to, to also back up what Nate was saying, and I share this in the chat box as, chat box as well. I share this document not only with my administration, but with our current uh, school improvement team chair. We also have, uh, we're a community model school, so I shared it with our community coordinator. And I did it all in one email intentionally, so they all knew that that was available and that I offered, as well as asked to be a part of the conversation as information rolled out. Um, remind your administration that, you know, you're a singleton usually in your school and that you're the one who's trained and has experience in education and how this should look. You wanna be authentic, but flexible. Absolutely. That's great. Um, I have another question for Carol. Uh, the, the music, uh, somebody posted a question about conductor safety. In other words, using goggles or plexiglass shields if you cannot feasibly do the 10 to 20 foot distance from the first row due to room size. Um, can you talk about that and maybe other, any other music teacher safety uh, clear, uh, guidelines that you've come up with? Um, I think the only recommendation we made in this document was the amount of space between you and the ensemble. So if there's not, the space is not there, I think we're going to have to, to wait a little bit and see the aerosol rates before we talk about that. But definitely, um, we need to look at those recommendations for conductor safety. That's a concern of mine, especially because I'm not in the 65 age range, but I'm not in the 35 age range. So uh, I'm concerned about that. And uh, as we get those recommendations, that will be a part of that teacher safety from each of the sections. Thanks for that. And um, somebody, I think Chuck had mentioned that the Charlotte Mecklenburg teachers were collaborating at this point, and I'm sure a lot of other teachers are collaborating. Is there a forum or a place, um, do you all have spaces on your website where teachers can share uh, their, their ideas and experience and perhaps uh, learn, other teachers can come and learn from those? That might be a, a good thing for people to know about. We so, are, oh, I'm sorry, Brandon, go ahead. I was just gonna say, um, DPI is starting their first of four um, PLCs, professional learning community meetings this afternoon. 
Um, Carol is actually going to help us with uh, the music and we're gonna start to discuss ways that people have brainstormed how to be successful um, in plan A, plan B and plan C. Um, we are hoping to make these a monthly event throughout the summer and uh, probably into the fall as well so that these our teachers can continue this conversation. And they, they can find out information about that on the DPI website? Um, on our Google site, yep. Yep, okay, great. And I think we have links for all of the um, arts education groups on the slides. The slides um, are available now on our training and resources page. We're also gonna have the video up later um, in the day, hopefully, that you can share with your administrators or other people. Um, it will also be on our open arts page as well. Um, so please feel free to come back and look at this again and to use those slides. The links are all active in the slides, so you'll be able to have all the links that are here. Um, let me double check if there's other. Okay, so there is a, a question here about teaching artists. Um, and I don't know how much that's going to happen, um, the so, bringing in of outside teaching artists in the coming months. I'll, um, take, the, I'll take the teaching artist question. I will say that um, currently uh, I'm just, we're, uh, there is a conversation going on and Arts North Carolina is um, just now beginning a conversation with North Carolina Arts Council around um, training and resources specifically for teaching artists. Uh, obviously, teaching artists coming into schools is going to be a particular challenge uh, as we move into the school year. There are a lot more questions now about that um, than answers, but uh, that is um, something that we are, are indeed working on um, and, and just, just starting that conversation with folks that are a lot smarter than me uh, in regards to teaching artists. So um, if you are not signed up for the Arts North Carolina mailing list, I encourage everyone to go to artsnc.org, sign up for our email list, and um, that's how we're getting all the information out. Uh, and then um, when, we, when we know some more about teaching artists and, and uh, how that's gonna be addressed, then we'll be sending that information out through those channels. I have a question for my arts team. They're texting me from my high school. Um, typically, we make a schedule for the following year in May. And we announce to the kids when there's going to be concerts, what musical we're going to do, um, when there'll be dance concerts and things like that. We have not done that and are concerned about getting the kids excited about the following school year. We have also not told the kids all of these guidelines that, hey guys, we might not be singing together at the beginning of the school year. What recommendations can you offer um, to teachers like that? Should we be making dates for performances and um, getting the kids excited for the following year? Uh, I would, uh, I talk to a lot of arts organizations throughout the state and um, that there's no arts organization that doesn't have three to 30 different contingency plans for how they're going to address the coming year. Um, obviously, uh, there is a section in this um, in the recommendations for performances uh, and as well as um, you know uh, shows, visual art shows uh, and concerts. But we are not going over that because um, today, primarily because uh, performances are a big question mark. Um, they're not even uh, you know theaters are not open. That is not an activity that we are actively doing in North Carolina right now. We don't know exactly when that is going to be an activity. Um, so make a plan, um, figure out when those are, um, but uh, certainly I don't think you want to publicize dates because um, everything is very TBA across the entire state uh, and, and across the entire country. Um, maybe, and I'm not an educator, but maybe think about new things to get the kids excited about, like the fact that there's going to be days of remote learning, so they'll be kind of like actors on TV or like, you know, kids in a music video uh, as opposed to specific concerts, right? So we're gonna um, have to be, continue to be creative and across the entire creative community uh, about how we, how we plan for that. Nay, I can add to that. In Durham, we've already scheduled um, our CAPS performances, our, you know, our, our local artists and, and shows that we participate with our local theater and um, artists. 
we were told we didn't schedule anything before January. So everything has been scheduled January and beyond all those performances and our local theater is putting it online. Uh, so we have the online option in case, um, you know, for some reason we still can't have an in-person performance. Um, so I think some of that is going to be up to your LEA. Um, but I just can just wanted to share that that's what our district is doing is just everything beyond January. Any other questions, Christine? Um, well, yes, and actually this is kind of more of a comment. Um, we had a, a, an example here from um, App State University where they're making their galleries and um, things coming, working on virtual tours and things for their, for their people, local people to use in their classrooms. And I'm sure that there are other facilities at universities or um, museums and galleries and things like that, that will be creating these resources as well. And so I just wanted to kind of encourage everyone to reach out to the local resources in your community and across the state, that they're probably providing a lot of things that you can use in your classroom at this time. Absolutely. Our partners at the North Carolina Symphony and the North Carolina Museum of Art have all been working very rigorously on this. Um, so all that information has been shared on their Facebook pages and also on our um, DPI Arts Ed one. Great. And and also, I posted um, that. Oh, sorry. I was going to yeah. say also Carolina Ballet and American Dance Festival are putting out a lot of dance videos um, of, of past works and dance films that are being created right now by local dance artists. So those are great things to, to keep in touch with as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I did post in the Facebook page that the, the um, because Brandon did post it in the Zoom group, but I posted it on the Facebook page, the Google site that they have for DPI where, um, where those sessions will be taking place. Um, there's another question here about competition season, um, specifically for things like marching band or theater. Um, does anyone know what kind of, uh, questions could possibly, you know, is, is it, are there any, have been, there made any decisions about those kinds of competitions yet, or are they kind of waiting to see what's going to happen with the school districts? So I, I think that, um, that this is something I've heard. Um, all of those uh, competitions, I would imagine that all these groups would back me up. Cannot say for certain whether or not they're going to be holding their competitions or their conference because they're not even certain that your school district will allow children to be put on a bus to go to them. So there are a lot of decisions that are um, being made right now at the local level. Uh, and I think that um, it's a little premature to be able to say 100% yes or no. Uh, I'll let each individual group talk about whatever events and conferences they might be having but my understanding right now is that it is difficult to, um, to book something that involves students traveling like that because, uh, because individual school districts have not made those determinations and that's more to come. Nate, and I think it's also important to point out the fact that that's a decision that comes from the governor's office and DHHS before it even comes to DPI or the local school board. So um, you, there, the DHHS has released a wonderful document about how to open up public schools and there's a decision tree in it. Um, so if, if you're curious about how those decisions are being made, please feel free to look it up. So if you call up Angie right now at the North Carolina Theater Conference and ask her whether or not a play festival is happening, she doesn't know because the governor has to make some, have, have some conversations first as long as a lot of other conversations. Someone said that there's marching band competitions that are posted everywhere in the North Carolina area. I think that people are being very optimistic. Um, and also with these guidelines, even if um, Arts NC provides this document with guidelines, it's like Brandon said, that's going to come from, those decisions will come from the state level and also from the local level. You can't participate in a marching band competition if your principal has told you you can't travel anywhere. So um, I certainly think we should all be optimistic, but understand uh, we are um, in an uncertain time. <laughs> I think, uh, adding to what Carol was saying, it, we are totally dependent on what our LEAs are telling us, what our principals are telling us, 
Uh, and yet we all plan for the future. Uh, if they would tell me in January, yes, it's okay, you can do a musical this spring. That's great. I can't start planning a musical in January and have it ready in March. I have to plan now as if I was going to do a musical in March, knowing full well that all of that planning work may go by the wayside or may be put aside for another year to the next spring. But same thing with fall. Uh, we are looking at possibilities for a fall show that we can put into competition. I know other schools are doing the same thing. Um, I also know from talking with Angie with NCTC, and they're, they're the sponsors of the fall competitions that most of us participate in, um, that their board is waiting and looking at the situation, and they're trying to stay fully aware of what's happening across the state and making an informed decision. So it, it, everything is up in the air, but we have to plan optimistically so that the plans are done and so that things are in place if the doors open and allow us to move forward. Okay, I don't think we have any more new questions. Great. Well, um, everybody, we've, we've gone a little over an hour, so um, this might be a good place to, uh, to end it. I think we can review, uh, we'll go back through the chat box and, and comments on Facebook. And if there's any questions that we missed, we'll make sure that those get to the appropriate presenters uh, so that their organizations can answer that. Uh, I wanna thank Christine for helping to moderate these questions, uh, as well as Laura, Carol, Chuck, Rebecca, uh, Brandon and Sayward for helping us out today. Um, and, and also Angie, who is a big contributor to this document as well at North Carolina Theater Conference. Um, real quick, because we are a nonprofit, I want to thank um, those sponsors that help support um, Arts North Carolina. Uh, they they trans all transitioned their sponsorship commitments from our big uh, annual advocacy day over to our COVID-19 programming uh, so that they could um, make sure that we were doing uh, programming like this and, and helping to get this document together and getting us all ready for next season and next school year. So. A big thank you to those sponsors as well. And uh, as, as we've said, this is going to be available on the um, Arts North Carolina website at artsnc.org. Go to the COVID-19 training videos and resource page. Uh, it'll probably be up there later on this afternoon. So I encourage you to, um, to spread the word, uh, share the Facebook live event. Let me make sure that that information gets out there as well. And uh, Please make sure that you're sending your colleagues um, to this document uh, to use in their advocacy and in their preparations as well as this video. Uh, and thank you all for joining us today. Yeah, I wanna just say one quick thing. Uh, Angie Hayes, who is also one of our board members, chimed in on the chat that uh, to remind everyone that if you are enjoying the resources that we're providing right now, that Arts NC is a membership organization. And you can join as an individual or you can also join as an organization. And another way to support us is to buy an Arts NC license plate. Um, and the information for that is on our website as well. So I just wanted to, to highlight that, what Angie had just said for the people on Facebook who didn't get a chance to see it. Thank you so much, Angie. Great. Everyone, you have a fantastic day, and uh, we look forward to working with all of our, our education partners um, as we get ready for schools to reopen and continue arts education in our great state of North Carolina. Thank you all very much.